dir que estem parlant d'un territori, d'una ciutat, en què la pau és apreciada i que representa un compromís personal de molts ciutadans i un compromís de moltes institucions. Catalunya en algun moment no fa massa, arreu de les protestes quan s'anunciava la guerra de l'Irac, es va convertir en un referent, en un aparador d'aquesta opinió pública i hem de dir que aquesta mobilització és realment el motor, en definitiva, de moltes coses i per tant voldríem també en aquest acte recordar-ho, tenir-ho present i dir que en el fons d'aquella mobilització i d'aquelles mobilitzacions donen força per seguir endavant. També podria parlar que alguna vegada, avui parlarà concretament d'una campanya, ens parlarà de la Rebeca, de la campanya de control d'armes, de control d'armes, que dic que les campanyes representen una focalització d'aquesta mobilització, és a dir, la mobilització necessita objectius i les campanyes representen una focalització, o sigui, és a dir, ens preocupen molt les armes lleugeres, que és el que avui parlarem, però també ens preocupen les bombes de dispersió, les bombes de raïm, també ens preocupen molt les armes nuclears, ens preocupa molt tot el que signifiqui un instrument homicida. I per tant, doncs, hem de situar les coses, les dit de dir, necessitem objectius concrets, aquest n'és un, però hem de recordar que també n'hi ha molts altres al costat d'aquests. I dir també, i volia dir-ho, que sembla que no hem de tenir dubtes que avancem. És a dir, la realitat de cada dia, la realitat quotidiana, és realment complicada i la violència està present a la vida internacional d'una manera que sempre és excessiva, hi hagi el nivell que hi hagi, però realment és feriós, diguem, a veure el nivell de violència que encara hi ha. Això ens podria conduir al desànim però em fa l'efecte que no hi tenim que deixar cap escletxa en el desànim, perquè podem constatar en moltes coses que avancem, pensem, per exemple, que hi ha un precedent a la campanya aquesta contra les armes lleugeres, que és la campanya contra les mines personals, en la qual es va obtenir un èxit notable. I, d'alguna manera, la campanya actual, d'alguna manera, podria dir que hi té relació o que n'és filla d'aquella campanya. I després d'aquesta en vindran altres. I, per tant, doncs, tenim elements i tenim objectius a proposar-nos i objectius que jo diria que anem a aconseguir. I finalment voldria presentar la nostra conferenciant d'avui. Voldria recordar també que les persones que han precedit a la Rebeca aquí en aquesta tribuna són persones com Major Zaragoza, com el Premi Noel Òscar Àries, actualment que torna a ser president de Costa Rica, i Cora Weiss, presidenta de l'International Peace Bureau. És a dir, estem parlant sempre de primeres figures, en el sentit d'entendre'ns de primeres figures, no estem parlant de prima dones, i en aquest cas la dona estaria molt ben dit, però sinó que estem parlant de persones que es converteixen en un moment determinat amb líders d'un determinat moviment, amb líders d'una determinada campanya, i per tant, doncs, penso que això sempre té la voluntat per part nostra de connectar les nostres inquietuds, els ciutadans de Catalunya, connectar-les amb coses que s'estan fent a nivell mundial. És a dir, la nostra no és una lluita romàntica, aïllada, vull dir que no té connexions, sinó que som ben conscients que estem en un món globalitzat i, per tant, que qualsevol cosa que fem aquí ha de tenir punts de referència exteriors i ha de tenir lligants amb l'exterior. Bé, parlant ja de Rebeca Peters, Rebeca Peters és advocada, és periodista, jo no sé si és australiana o si és nord-americana, veus que és nascuda a Nord-Amèrica però ciutadana australiana, veus com hem dit que ho entendria, per tant, doncs, va avançant, diguem, a la normalització lingüística, i té una llarga trajectòria, a pesar de la seva joventut, té una llarga trajectòria, penso que ell parlava de 17 o de 18 anys, com a directora de programes per desmilitarització, programes de conversió d'indústria militar en indústria civil, programes de recerca de les causes de violència, etc. I actualment és directora d'IANSA. IANSA és una xarxa una xarxa d'acció internacional, International Action Network, 
fons molt arts, o sigui, per tant, una xarxa internacional d'acció sobre les armes petites. Armes petites, que no ens confonguem, armes petites vol dir una arma que un home molt fort pugui agafar, vull dir, una dona molt forta pugui agafar, per tant, no es tracta només de la pistola, que ja fa prou mal, sinó que estem parlant també de metralladores, estem parlant de llança, el que sigui, vull dir, que una persona pugui transportar, o que es pugui transportar simplement amb un cotxe, és a dir, que no es necessiti un transport militar molt pesat per dur-lo, per tant, no estem parlant només d'armes de butxaca, diguem-ne, sinó que estem parlant d'armes que realment fan molt mal i amb les quals no només es poden fer un atracament, sinó que es poden fer guerres. Per tant, aleshores ell ens en parlarà, no vull ficar amb el terreny. Jo sí que voldria dir, perquè ell potser no ho dirà, que IANSA és una xarxa, no és una ONG a l'estil, per exemple, d'una ONG com Amnistia Internacional, per exemple, sinó que es tracta d'una xarxa. I aquí jo crec que hi ha un element que hem de valorar, vull dir, els que ens haurà de pensar sobre aquestes coses, que és un element molt creatiu. O sigui, no es tracta de crear a vegades una institució que és capaç de tenir uns grans braços i molts delegats i moltes coses, sinó que es tracta de saber recollir la força que existeix en molts grups locals a molts països, IANSA està present a 100 països i també és de 700 grups que treballen per IANSA i en canvi IANSA és simplement un nucli molt cohesionat i molt ben portat i molt ben dirigit, però és simplement un nucli que s'aprofita de la força existent local a molts punts i per tant jo crec que és realment un model de gestió, és un model de gestió realment important. IANSA es va presentar en societat l'any 99, perquè l'any 99 alguns de vosaltres recordareu que es va fer a l'AIA una trobada sobre pau que commemorava una que s'havia fet a finals del segle XIX, i per tant a finals del segle XX se'n va voler fer una altra. Em van sortir documents importants, per exemple una agenda d'acció que inspira moltes de les accions que s'estan duent a terme a molts llocs del món, i en el 99 es va presentar en societat. Va ser creada, en realitat, em sembla, IANSA en el 98. Bé, aleshores, Rebeca és directora de IANSA des de l'any 2002. I també dic que IANSA, doncs, llavors, ha llançat, és la que ha llançat la campanya aquesta mundial que n'hi ha de control d'armes, que es refereix a aquestes armes lleugeres de les quals parlava, i una de les coses aconseguides i molt importants és que IANSA ha aconseguit l'estatut de ser la veu de la societat civil a Nacions Unides. Aleshores, el mes de, no sé si era juny o juliol, doncs entre juny i juliol a New York hi va haver l'assemblea a la qual prèviament es va fer reunió amb la Fundació, per exemple, com a grup local de Iança i va assistir també. Allà va reconèixer la Rebeca i, per tant, dic que estem parlant d'una xarxa amb presència mundial, una xarxa que té veu a Nacions Unides i això és el que venim a escoltar una mica com estan anant les coses i en quin estat està tota la qüestió. Dir-vos que abans que parli de la Rebeca us passarem uns vídeos, un dura un minut i l'altre dura un minut i mig. Per tant, no ho usarem de nosaltres, sinó que simplement passarem uns vídeos per contextualitzar encara una mica més aquesta xerrada de la Rebeca.
Kenya, I am a million face. A million face, eh? And I am in New York now. I represent you and I take you to Kofi Annan and I am sure that Kofi Annan will do something and let us change to control a smaller land. From all over the world, I present the, to you one million faces of people who want tough control on harms transfer. Thank you. Where I am going from, it is a very uh, difficult place because we are suffering. I just moved from there and surrender my gun to the police and I start running from that time. And when I go back to Kenya, I will tell those young men, leave those guns. And they them just leave those and be together. La Rebeca farà la seva exposició en anglès, en català no s'atreveix encara, i parla un espanyol molt correcte, però s'estima més bé l'exposició en anglès. Penso que teniu els aparells als qui vulgueu fer-lo servir, i si no, algú es pot reunir cada fa. Thank you, Alfonso. Thank you, everyone, for coming uh, tonight. It's a, it's a great honor to be here in this building and also a great honor to be in Catalonia where in the time that I've been here, I've learned a great deal about the, the commitment, the very concrete commitment that has been shown by the government and the people and the institutions in Catalonia to peace, to a culture of peace, not only here at home, but also internationally. Um, it's, um, it's a great honor for me also to speak uh, as part of this series. Uh, Cora Weiss and um, Oscar Arias, who uh, were mentioned, who were two of my predecessors in this series, uh, heroes of mine and members of Ananza. So it's, uh, I'm, I'm very, very pleased to be here. Um, my, I represent IANSA, as you've heard. Uh, my Catalan is, um, you know, uh, <laughs> not perfect. So, <laughs> at the beginning of the introduction, I was understanding what was said. Part way through, I wasn't completely sure I understood, but I felt it would be impolite. To um, put my to start with, <laughs> to look for translation. So um, I am grateful also for the translation. Um, so I'm the director of IANSA, which is the International Action Network on Small Arms. IANSA is the global movement against gun violence. It's a network of more than 700 organizations working against the proliferation and misuse of guns in more than 100 countries. And our network consists of women's groups, churches, public health organizations, academics, human rights activists, development agencies, humanitarian workers, victim support groups, trade unions, teachers, youth groups, all kinds of groups that who are not specialists in small arms and who would prefer not to spend their time thinking about about violence, about guns, but they have found that their lives and their work is so badly affected by the flood of guns around the world that they have joined this network because they realize that they, they have to do something. Um, when I say uh, small arms, there is a, 
a definition of small arms used by the UN, which relates to um, certain types of firearms. But in fact, we what we see around the world is that people who are using guns in violence, they don't really distinguish between was this gun designed for military use or was it designed for hunting. Um, very often there wasn't, um, the original intention of the design of the gun is not, uh, bears no connection with its eventual use in violence. And uh, so we see, for example, the same guns used in in urban violence in Philadelphia and in Johannesburg, the 9mm pistol, very common in both of those places. We see uh, AK-47s used in conflict zones in Central Africa, and we also see them being used in the narcotrafico in Central America. And so the, the, the weapons, uh, the different, the specific categories of weapons within this class, this group called small arms, have become very mixed up. Small arms is a term that is used by, um, by the diplomatic community. In English we have a very short word which is guns. So that's the word that I tend to use. Um, the people um, who make up our network Many of them are involved in research and in providing information and they bring that to influence the, the positions and the actions of the network. But also they bring their direct experience of working in places um, in the slums of the big cities like Manila or Lagos, Nigeria, in the marketplaces of Uganda or Kenya which have now become very dangerous or on the, the battlefields of, for example, the Democratic Republic of Congo, it is there and not it is there that the impact of the proliferation of small arms is felt. And not so much in Brussels or New York or Geneva, where important where de the decisions are made in Brussels, New York, Geneva, uh, which is affecting the lives of people in the Philippines in Thailand, in El Salvador, uh, and in Brazil. So part of our role as IANSA is to bring the experience and the knowledge of our members from the regions um, into those discussions which take place in the capital cities in the north. We also, uh, as Alphonse mentioned, I think, um, we are the official coordinator of civil society involvement in the UN meetings related to small arms and that has, um, has given us very good access to the decisions that go on there. So what is the problem with uh, small arms? The most obvious problem is that they cause a very large number of deaths. In uh, the, his um, Millennium Report, his report for the Millennium, Kofi Annan, who was the Secretary General of the United Nations, said that small arms could well be described as weapons of mass destruction. And that is because of the very, very large number of people who are killed every year. Between 300,000 and 500,000 people each year are killed. That's about 1,000 people each day. And uh, those are 1,000 lives every day ended by gunshots uh, in situations where people are angry or vengeful or jealous or drunk or careless or corrupt or abusive and in situations of of war when soldiers are firing at people for the purpose of, uh, for political purposes. Of those 1,000 people who are killed every day, most of them are in the, the developing world. And of those 1,000 people, on average, about 560 are homicides, that is like a, a criminal homicide, so the majority are homicides, about 250 are uh, deaths in a war, that is where a soldier is shooting a person as part of his job in armed conflict. 
about 140 are suicides and about 50 are accidents or cases where the intention is not clear. And the, those numbers tell us something that many people would find surprising, that more people are killed with guns in crime than in war. I, do you find that surprising? Does anybody here find that surprising? No? You all knew that already? Um, but for many, for that, uh, many, um, a lot of policymakers are surprised by that, and <laughs> because they think um, and and they gun, guns kill more people than all the other weapons, the military weapons uh, combined, and but but even more than those people are people who are killed in crime, and and why is that? One reason is because armed conflict is decreasing. Thank you, the United Nations, uh, and the huge amount of effort around the world that is going on with in mediation and in peacekeeping. And there's an enormous project of trying to stop armed conflict and reduce armed conflict. Um, and there has not been a similar effort devoted to reducing interpersonal conflict or armed crime. And another reason why gun deaths in crime are larger than gun deaths in conflict is because the end of a conflict is often followed by a crime wave. Um, very often the emphasis when there's a war is everybody is trying to end the conflict. Then they have, they sign the peace agreement, yay, and they take the photographs, they open the champagne, everybody's very happy, the conflict is finished. But if the, if the guns are still there, then what you have the next morning is a lot of young men who were previously involved in fighting the war, they were soldiers in some form, whether they were government soldiers or paramilitaries or rebels, uh, now the war is over, those soldiers have no job, they have no structure in their life and no, no way of earning a living for themselves or their families, but they still have their guns. And so it's not surprising in that circumstance that those young men um, choose crime as a way to get money to, uh, to stay alive for themselves and their families if there are no other opportunities. Um, and, and that's why very often after a conflict you have a crime wave. The, according to the Red Cross, um, deaths by small arms are often between 60 and 80 percent higher in the 18 months after the end of a war than they were before the end of the war. And we're actually um, um, seeing that, and that you can also see this phenomenon sometimes before the war finishes. I mean, we can see this in Iraq, for example, where on the one hand there's a war and people are being killed as part of the conflict, but also there's this huge increase in banditry, in kidnappings, and in violence, which is not, which is violence by, from, not related specifically to the war. And a third reason why homicides with guns outnumber war deaths with guns is that the nature of small arms proliferation, and that is that um, there are more than 640 million small arms in the world and 60% of them are in private hands. So the, the <coughs> private civilian arsenal on Earth is 50% larger than the state arsenal of small arms. Um, and, uh, and so then it's maybe not so surprising that if most of the guns are in civilian hands, that most of the perpetrators of, of gun violence and also the victims of gun violence will be civilians. Um, I, I, I told you that I wanted to give you a picture of uh, a bit of the, the statistical nature of the, of the deaths problem. Of course, apart from those deaths, uh, small arms cause a lot of very serious injuries. For every death, there are around three very serious uh, injuries, including, you know, uh, for example, small arms are a major cause of spinal injury and paralysis now. And uh, 
and many of those injuries are caused by stray bullets, by like balas perdidas, you know. Um, um, and those and the, those injuries are especially disabling in um, in the developing world. One of our members, an NGO in Guatemala, who works. They work in rehabilitation of young people who have been shot. Um, and he explained to us, he said, you know, um, in Guatemala, the, of course, most victims of, gun, of small arms are poor, from poor families. And uh, so if you're poor, you cannot afford a wheelchair. Um, and anyway, in rural areas, the roads, it doesn't you can't really use a wheelchair. So he said for, for, for young people who are shot, it means that, and that they are doomed to spend most of their life inside the house unless occasionally when a strong uncle or brother comes to visit who can carry them outside. It's, it's a, an aspect, I thought that story really illustrated, you know, we think, oh yes, terrible injuries, but you think about the lives of people um, especially in the countries where there is very little support for people who are seriously injured. Um, that's a very high price to pay. And it's, it's a high price not only for the individual victims, but also for their communities and societies. Um, in El Salvador, the, the cost of violence in the economy was um, $1.7 billion in 2003. That was when it was measured. And that in El Salvador is the same as 11% of the GDP. And it is more than twice the amount of the total health budget plus the total education budget. So it's, just, it's an enormous uh, tax. Violence puts an enormous tax on a poor country. And, and especially in, in, for example, in terms of healthcare, one of our members who is a, a surgeon from Uganda, and she was telling me about the impact of gun violence on, on the fragile healthcare services in a, in a developing country. Gunshot injuries are more expensive to treat, they require more medicine, more time in hospital, more time from doctors than other types of health problems. And she told me, about her um, dilemma as a doctor working in a, in a rural clinic about having to decide, here's a person with a gunshot injury and here are children who have other, who have contagious diseases or who have other healthcare problems. It takes, you take away from several other people the resources, the medical resources, often the blood supply, to be able to treat one person with a gunshot injury. It places doctors in a situation that they should never be in. The, so I've, I've given you some concrete examples there, um, a bit, um, well, uh, yeah, some concrete examples of the, of the impact of small arms proliferation on health. And it's a similar story with, uh, with, for other dimensions like human rights and democracy, governance and development. The, the flood of gun, guns undermines development, it creates a, a climate, a culture of fear and violence. It contributes to a, a destructive spiral of violence and poverty. And one of the um, things, one of the characteristics of this problem of guns is that people perceive, uh, I mean, my society's danger is dangerous because other people have guns. So my solution is to get a gun myself. And so the very, the solution that, um, that many people choose is actually adding to the problem. One of, um, um, and of course, well, I might talk a bit later about that, maybe I'll say something now, about that issue of, that the, the perception that, uh, that that small arms bring you safety. This is a perception that the the gun lobby, the pro gun lobby, is very um, keen to promote. Um, and there's a, a logic that 
it can be either for governments at the national level or for people in their own homes, that if you have the power to kill other people, then you will be safer. Um, and it doesn't work for governments, as we're seeing now, uh, the countries that have enormous amounts of, of weaponry, when you begin, they begin to see the proliferation of that weaponry in their societies. It does not make them safer. And it also doesn't work for people in their homes. If you have a gun in your house, it increases by f between three and four times the likelihood of a death of a homicide or a suicide occurring in your house. And so it's a particularly pernicious myth that uh, when you buy a gun um, because you want to be safe, you actually are introducing danger in your home. One of our members, um, another one of our members is the Center for Humanitarian Dialogue in Geneva. They work on mediation and a lot of humanitarian and conflict related problems. And they did a survey of humanitarian workers in refugee camps and in famine relief programs. Um, um, the people that you see on television talking about Sudan and um, uh, Somalia and places like that. And they asked them about what were the obstacles to their work and about the role of small arms. And they, find, they, they reported that many of these agencies that they spend up to 30% of their budget is spent on security measures to protect the workers and the aid um, supplies from armed violence. And it's, um, um, and also another finding of that survey was that the single most common problem that was mentioned by the, uh, the aid workers was the, the danger of uh, civilians, uh, bandits, um, or um, unorganized groups of men with guns. So it's, and one of the things that it's, it's surprising to me that the international humanitarian and development agenda has not been connected very much up until now with this problem of the proliferation of guns, when clearly, if you think of all the people who send their donations to Oxfam or to, um, I don't know what the big organizations would be in Spain, but these uh, Save the Children or all these groups that do this great work, if you think, wow, up to 30% of that is having to be spent on armed guards, it's just... And also, some of the major aid donors in the world, the countries like the United States and the United Kingdom um, and other countries in Europe, which give a lot of money for international and development and humanitarian aid through their aid agencies, they're not, they haven't noticed that the, another government agency is selling, supplying guns into those same regions, and therefore that the money that's been given to build a, a, a clinic is wasted if, because of armed conflict, uh, you cannot get a doctor to work in that clinic, or because of armed conflict, the entire community has to move and ends up living in a refugee camp. And um, so it's sort of, um, um, that's, that's a, there, there are connections there that we are trying to make and that we hope will become more, um, will, will uh, become more well known, I suppose. I want to just, before I stop, finish talking about the, the problem, I just want to mention because it is the, um, tomorrow uh, is International Women's Day, um, the particular gendered aspect of the, um, of the small arms problem. Most of the victims of small arms, the direct, the, the bodies which are hit by a bullet, are men. They're young men, um, usually, certainly between 20, between 15 and 34, uh, are the, the vast majority of people who are shot. Uh, and the huge majority of people who pull the trigger are also young men. So both from the point of, from either end of the, of the weapon, you have a man. And um, in, um, and in the, the whole, the, the industry, the commerce, the, the whole business of, um, of making and selling and buying and transferring guns, 
Um, as with many other industries, that's also very dominated by men, of course, and in the processes of deciding about um, what should be done about this problem, that's very dominated by men because that's the nature of governments and of diplomacy. Um, and it's, uh, there's also in many, in many places, including a lot of industrialized countries, an association between between guns and masculinity. Like there's a traditional idea of masculinity that if you are able to frighten other people or to injure other people, then you are more masculine than somebody who who doesn't, who's not frightening or dangerous. And uh, and it's interesting in these United Nations meetings that we have. So it's like a meeting with diplomats, important ambassadors, officials from government agencies making policy, they, uh, many of them have said to us, oh well, in our country, you know, guns are part of a man. There's nothing we can do. <laughs> you know, I think, are you telling me that's, that's, that's a, a crazy, irrational thing to say in an international policy discussion, but it's very, very closely tied in. Um, some of our members in the Middle East have pointed out that in, in Yemen, the traditional wedding photograph, you know, on the day of your wedding, you take a photo and everybody has this in their houses. There's the bride in her beautiful white dress, there's the man in his nice suit, and there's the AK-47. So there's three figures in the traditional wedding photo. That's the family, that's the matrimonio, you know. <laughs> So there's a, it's a very, um, and, and I think this is one reason why it's, it's quite um, challenging to pursue this problem because it is very tied in with a traditional culture which is also, which relates to much larger problems of militarism and things like that. Um, and in, although most of the people who, who are shot, most of the bullets enter bodies that are male, um, there are particular types of gun violence where, where women are overwhelmingly the victims. And those are, for example, um, sexual assault in, during, during conflict. We now see in some conflict zones that systematic rape has become a weapon of war, that it, it, it seemed to serve uh, a political purpose of demoralizing the other side in the war is to rape the women um, belonging to that community. Um, and that is um, um, the, 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 the it's, it's quite recent that that has begun to be recognized as an aspect of war and not just you know a series of individual crimes or well these things happen. The other thing is in domestic violence, in um, family violence, that's a particular uh, type of um, violence where guns are frequently used to maintain a regime of terror in the home and women are overwhelmingly the victims there. And I can also tell you that in civil society, women and women's groups have been at the forefront of campaigning to change uh, the situation. and. Whether that's um, because, I mean, we, ha we have a women's network which is um, where the members have said um, women, you know, women bring life into the world. So in a sense they feel that women, um, or that, that women don't put any stock by this idea that having the power to kill someone is a good thing. That's, and so we found in many countries that, and the particular role that women play, even in countries which are very patriarchal. Um, often, for example, we had a campaign in, uh, in Brazil and also one in Australia, which was aimed at women, saying to women, talk to your sons, you know, don't let, you know, don't have guns in your house. You are the queen of the house. Uh, so if there are guns in your house, you need to clean your house and sort of kind of building on that sort of thing. Um, uh, so there's a particular um, a particular role for women in this campaign, which we are also trying to get recognised in the United Nations discussions. So anyway, so that tells you a little bit about the problem, um, which is caused because guns are 
guns are, why are guns so easily, so widely available? One reason is because we had a great act for peace, which was the end of the Cold War, in, at the end of the 1980s, when the dismantling of the great Soviet armies caused hundreds of millions of small arms to flow onto the free market. Uh, there was no control in place to what will happen when these countries are reducing their armies. There was nothing in place to, to prevent the guns from just spilling out. And those guns have, have now turned up, especially in Africa, but also in, 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 in India, in, in Nepal, uh, in, in the, the Middle East, in the Balkans, in Latin America, all over the world. And the thing about small arms is they're very, um, they last a long time. They're, they're, they're quite simple machines in a way, and they are, they're a fantastic product, you know? They're, they, they're cheap, they're, they, they last a long time, they're a fantastic product for killing, designed for killing. And um, so a lot of guns that are in Africa now, for example, might have been a gun made in a country of Eastern Europe for an army mm -hmm. in the Soviet Union, and then, when the Cold War ended, those guns, uh, many of them were bought, sold by, for example, I don't know if people have seen the, the, the film um, Lord of War with Nicolas Cage. In that film, uh, Nicolas Cage is a, a broker, and he buys and sells these guns from, from different places, including the surplus weapons from armies. So those, that, that, a, a gun from there might have been sold to someone who uh, was, it flew to, for example, to Libya. Libya is a common transit point for, for guns. And then it sold to someone else, and then it went, uh, say, down to um, Liberia, where it might have been involved in, the, uh, in the, the conflict in Liberia, which was an extremely, it was a horrendous and very bloody conflict at the heart of which was a relatively small group of men with small arms. That war ended and many of those weapons have moved on to Sierra Leone where they were involved in more in a conflict there. And there is another movie uh, with uh, Leonardo DiCaprio um, <laughs> on Blood Diamond. Now the, even Hollywood has begun to recognize the, the significance of this issue. Um, and then at the end of the war in Sierra Leone, some uh, weapons have moved into to Cote d'Ivoire, where there's a conflict still going on. And the thing is that the guns, are, it's not, it's a product that can, can, continues to be just as lethal, uh, conflict after conflict. And it's light, it's easily transported, it's cheap. It's actually, that is the, the, the it's the, the fact that guns are so light and, and ha, is what has made possible the phenomenon of child soldiers. Because in the old days, when wars were fought with heavy weapons, you couldn't, you couldn't, um, children could not serve as soldiers with, uh, with, with much larger weapons. But that, it, it's this proliferation of small arms that has given rise to that, uh, to that problem as well. So, we have a big problem. Ladies and gentlemen, Houston, we have a problem. Um, and so, what have we done? We've, um, our network has been working, we work at the, the national, regional and international levels, uh, recognizing that there are levels of, that, that, that policies at all of those levels, not just legislation, but also practices, like, um, you know, Things that are so, for example, when a, a police force of a city, when they decide to upgrade their weapons, you know, throw out the old uh, 38 Smith and Wesson revolver, buy the new fancy nine millimeter semi-automatic pistol, uh, very often those police departments will just sell the old guns. They sell them because they don't need them anymore. Um, and that's not a question of law very often, it's just a practice. And so there's, that's a, a quite local practice which creates an enormous problem. And then of course there are actual laws. So our members are working at, 
at uh, national, regional and international level to try to raise the standard and also to try to bring about a, a harmonization, a consistent and coherent standard of regulation because at present we have a, a patchwork of policies across the world and often within one country you will have a patchwork and the traffickers um, use and, and criminals use make use of the gaps in that of the inconsistencies uh, that is how they are able to um, to get around the law so it seems obvious but it has not been obvious apparently <laughs> it's, it, it's amazing how difficult it is to convince governments that you need a good law in your country and you need to lobby your neighbor to um, to it to, to make their law stronger, otherwise you will be affected by the policies next door. Two, prop, two countries that have a big problem with the policies of the country next door are Canada and Mexico. They both have a neighbor uh, with um, very problematic policies. And both Canada and Mexico have said that the, the um, majority of, of small arms that are captured by the police in their countries from crime have come from the USA. Um, but the USA is not very enthusiastic about international cooperation, about multilateralism in general, so that is, um, that is a challenge for us. So, in terms of the, the so that we've talked a bit there about national laws, and then at the at the global level, the UN has this process which has the something called the Program of Action. It's a it's an agreement, uh, politically binding. It's not a treaty, um, but it's an agreement where governments have put down some minimum standards that they agreed in 2001, and around the world. Countries have been moving slowly forward to implement uh, this agreement. So that is some, um, it's excruciatingly slow, but um, it's something. And what we find often, in, in 2001, when the agreement was made, I made a statement to the press saying, this is a disgrace. This agreement has a very low level of um, regulation. Uh, we need something better than this. I thought it was very, very weak. But what we've seen in the last five years is that because there is an agreement, uh, many governments have done more than is required of them. Um, and it's somehow that even if there's an agreement that is not very strong, if it's in the United Nations, it gives governments uh, courage to to go forward, and so I've, I I think that the program of action is not I'm 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 much less critical of it now than five years ago. But a big problem with the program of action on small arms is that it is the decisions are made in what they call consensus, and in the United Nations, consensus means unanimous. And so when the meetings of the United Nations process on small arms are held, um, one country can block everything. And that is what we have seen. We saw that in uh, July last year at the big UN meeting on small arms. We really made a lot of progress. Even countries like Iran, which traditionally not very sympathetic or helpful, but they were, you know, there was a lot of good work by, by governments and also by NGOs. Um, and they, you know, Iran had made some progress and it seemed possible that we might be able to, to push the, 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 to advance. But uh, the USA would not accept anything. So the, um, the meeting ended with no agreement which was um, a huge disappointment to us. But partly because of that disappointment, that gave a lot of governments, um, that made them say, 
we'll teach, we'll show them. You know, it gave them, um, uh, it motivated them to try to do something, uh, to try to, to, to try another avenue. And so, and we had also, we've also had a campaign. Um, hello? <laughs> no, I'm busy giving a speech. <laughs> Sorry. Um, we had, uh, we, form, we have a campaign called Control Arms, which you've heard a little bit about, which is a campaign with um, Amnesty International and Oxfam. To, and the object of that campaign is a treaty to control the international arms transfers. And three years ago, uh, the governments had said to us, well, that's very utopian, the idea of a treaty. You know, it's, uh, it's too difficult. But when this disappointment that we had in July kind of made some governments think, this is terrible. Like, how are we ever going to be able to achieve anything? And it made them be more prepared to work on the possibility of the treaty. Um, and so the, the and at the same time in July, we brought to the to Kofi Annan, as you saw in the video, um, it was a petition called the Million Faces Petition, which uh, in which we asked people around the world to put their faces on a, a, a petition on the internet, calling. For uh, to bring the arms trade under control, and we did manage to get about 1.3 million people around the world to put their faces on that petition, uh, and all around the world, our members had also been lobbying their governments. And so, between July, when we were terribly disappointed, and December, when the um, <laughs> General Assembly of the United Nations met. There was a huge effort, intensive lobbying effort, which uh, basically lobbying governments to say, you must go to the General Assembly and say, okay, let's get serious, we're not going to be blocked by a tiny number of countries. And we got a resolution passed at the General Assembly, which is to begin work on the Arms Trade Treaty, which will be a treaty to control the international transfers of weapons of conventional weapons, not only small arms, but also other conventional weapons, which is tanks and cannons and uh, bomber, the jets that drop bombs and things like that. And um, 153 countries voted to support that resolution in the General Assembly, which is a very, very large uh, vote. Uh, also, so 153 voted in favour, about 24 abstained and one country voted against it and I'm sure you can guess which country that was. Yes, the Texas. Um, <laughs> so what that means is that the Secretary General of the UN is now asking governments to send their views, their points of view, their opinions on what should be in the arms trade treaty. Um, and then there will be a group of governmental experts so that, so in 2007, the Secretary General uh, wants to know what the governments think. In 2008, there will be a group of, of experts, a working group, which will begin putting all this information received, all these points of view received, they'll begin drafting, we hope, for making the basic structure of a treaty. And then there'll be negotiation, lobbying, um, um, trading, um, and pushing, campaigning, so that we hope to have a treaty um, maybe by 2010, or maybe optimistically. And the treaty will say that International transfers of conventional weapons cannot be authorized if those weapons would contribute to a violation of human rights or to violations of, or to serious violations of human rights or of international humanitarian law, which is the law of war, or if they would undermine sustainable development. And um, 
the uh, so and that will be well it's a very very significant step where we've got to already it will be an even more significant step if we when 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 not if but when we get the treaty and then it will be a campaign to, for ratification and to get countries to sign up one reason why it will be important to have a treaty is that when countries ratify a treaty then the 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 rules in that treaty become part of their national law. And for example, we have now, you know, you probably have heard that sometimes the UN makes an arms embargo. It says there's an arms embargo on Sudan or on Somalia. That means no country should send arms to that country. But at the moment, there's no way of enforcing an arms embargo because it's just a statement at the United Nations. It has no force of law. And so the people who are involved in selling or transporting weapons into Sudan or eastern Congo or the this region where there's an embargo have not broken the law in any one country. And so they can't be prosecuted. It's... Um, it, it means that arms embargoes are completely symbolic right now. But when we have the treaty, that will make it possible to, to prosecute people who break arms embargoes, uh, and it will just give a lot more legitimacy to the UN, actually. So that's a big campaign for us. During the course of this year, our members will be pressuring governments to make sure they send their point of view to the Secretary General. We, we, we know that very often when the Secretary General asks governments for their opinions, most governments do not reply, especially the governments of developing countries don't send anything because they're too busy, they don't have capacity. Um, and so we've got, we, want, we need to make sure that this time that, the, that, people, that the voices of people in, in the countries most affected by the arms trade are actually heard by the United Nations. So we'll be organizing we have a series of events called Popular Consultations, People's Consultations on the Arms Trade Treaty in lots of countries, um, events which will be to raise awareness in the media and to put pressure on the government to say the, the Secretary General is waiting to hear from you. He wants to know what is our country's position on this treaty. And um, I'm sure they'll, that um, that uh, you, I, I'm sure that you'll all take part in pressuring the Spanish government to send its opinion to the Secretary General as well. So that's going to be something over the course of this year. And then there's still a lot of work to do. But the main thing, getting over this hurdle of getting into the United Nations and a process started is really a huge thing for NGOs, for tiny, you know, for some of our members, there's like a women's group in the frontier provinces of Pakistan or some um, a, a youth group in um, a, a, a refugee camp in Kenya. Um, for them to be able to, for their work to have had an effect in the United Nations is fantastic. Um, so that's a big thing coming up. We also um, have at this the um, at the same time we another challenge that's facing us is that the, the, in up until now the, there's been not very much. Um, in a sense, not much organized opposition to the movement to control small arms. The opposition has been from the big manufacturing companies, often from governments, because some governments profit from the sale of weapons. But there hasn't been really um, a global pro-gun lobby. But there's a very strong pro-gun lobby in the United States. And that group, has, the National Rifle Association, has begun to go global. So they have now begun to make connections with groups in Latin America um, and in South Africa, for example, in Australia, my own country. Um, and in, uh, um, and I, I'm sure they have connections in Spain, <laughs> to try to begin mobilizing, uh, to, to, to have a an opposition campaign based essentially on fear. And uh, 
the, the power of the gun lobby in the United States is very, very significant. In fact, uh, some members of the U.S. delegation at the United Nations, when I've been talking to them, I've said to him, look, you're an intelligent person. Uh, you're not... You're not bad, you know, you, I know. I'm sure you don't want a thousand people a day to be killed. <laughs> Why can you not take positions that are going to protect human life and, and, and the well-being of people all around the world? And he said, this is the USA. There is something called the National Rifle Association. These are facts. <laughs> As well. So, and basically, the gun lobby has a lot of influence it, with uh, with the government, and 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 it's not based on it's a kind of an ideology. I mean, it's it's just it's they that in the 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 meeting in June in July, the big the the conference which ended with no result. Just before it the National Rifle Association sent a message to all its members saying, the United Nations wants to take your gun. They're meeting in New York to vote on a treaty to prohibit gun ownership for civilians, which was completely, completely false. And they said to their members, write a letter to Kofi Annan and tell him to Stop not to stop this attack on your liberty. They received 110,000 letters at, in Kofi Annan's office, received 110,000 letters from um, gun owners in America who thought, I suppose, that Kofi wants my gun. It was just crazy. But that is the kind of power of to con to convoke, you know, to convene that the gun lobby has, and so if we begin to see that power manifested in d at different areas around the world, it's going to become much more difficult. So that's one of the um, the challenges that we face. But ultimately, and I'll I'll finish up here. Ultimately, we um, we have to succeed because. It cannot be that, uh, you know, as the world progresses, I mean, we have to be moving towards a culture of peace. We have to be moving towards a culture of, of cooperation, of living together, and of finding uh, and of solving our problems in a way that does not involve constantly the threat of force. Um, and also because as governments are realizing the true price that they're paying, um, the, um, the, the, they, I think, as it becomes, when you turn it into economics, somehow governments that don't, if you talk to them about 1,000 people <coughs> per day lying, dying, that's just like a statistic. But if you talk to them about X million dollars, then, oh, well, that's, if it's, if it's in money, then it's not a statistic. It's, then it's something to take into account. It's really a factor. So as we make the, the, the economic argument related to the, the, the uh, undermining of development and, um, and the lost opportunities, um, I, I mean, I, I have confidence that, that we'll get there. And we've begun to see, we, our members in Brazil had a huge campaign to change the law in Brazil. It's one of the most violent countries in the world. And they succeeded. They changed the law. Within one and a half years of the law changing, there was a reduction of 8% in the number of, uh, of gun deaths in Brazil. And that was, in Brazil, that's 3,000 lives saved. 8% sounds small. 3,000 people is a lot. Um, and the, the following year, uh, gun deaths dropped again. And so, and we can see that in the places where we actually are managing to get the policies changed, we're seeing a reduction in violence. And that is, um, I mean, and that is uh, the ultimate goal. So thank you very much for your um, support for, for this campaign by having me speak. And I'd be happy to answer questions or if there's time for discussion or something. Thank you.
Bé, no tenim massa temps, però sí que podem atendre algunes preguntes, algunes primeres preguntes que hi hagués dirigides a la senyora Peters. De manera que... Don, no sé si hi ha micro... Ah, perdó. Jo voldria fer una pregunta a la senyora Galeta. És el canal 3. És el canal 3. Per a mi no en inglès. 3. Ojalà. I és aquí. Bé, jo li volia fer una pregunta. Vostè està parlant sempre del control. Què es fa perquè no es produeixi? You are clearly a radical vegetarian. Yes, well, it's a very good point. And it seems that governments are very reluctant to consider regulating to stop. But what we have seen with, um, in some other campaigns is that if you, if you are able to bring about controls, what you do is you, it becomes uneconomical to manufacture. Um, and uh, because you close down the market. And, in, uh, and a good example actually has been uh, the, the, the Convention on Landmines. Some of the major manufacturers and suppliers of landmines have not ratified the treaty, like the USA and France, for example. But because most of the world has ratified the treaty, uh, there's no customers anymore to buy landmines. And so the production of landmines has dramatically reduced, um, even though those countries didn't, didn't sign up. Um, and um, I, I suppose, but the other, another actually possibility that we have not, that has been tried in, within some national context, but not internationally, is the possibility of litigation, of, of suing either a company or a government for the damage that is done by its, the weapons that it has, has put into the world and where they've da been done damage to other countries. Um, that's something we, um, we haven't done yet, but that's, uh, that's always a possibility. But essentially, because we think that, um, the, that we need to try to push governments to take the action that's necessary, um, we've been, and, 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 we, and we see no possibility of governments being prepared to actually say we're going to ban the manufacture. We're being a little bit more sneaky, I suppose. But, of course, I mean, you know, there's also projects underway to destroy weapons, especially after a war. The UN has put a lot of money into programs to collect these weapons and to destroy them, a huge, very expensive process. And recently we looked at the statistics and saw, so there's 8 million small arms being manufactured new every year at this end. And at the other end, there's about 800,000 small arms being destroyed every year. So it's not very proportional. <laughs> it's clearly completely crazy to just be depending on destroying guns as a solution to the problem. It has to be, we have to, to bring about a reduction in the production. Intentaré acotar-me amb una pregunta només, perquè el fet que estigui avui amb nosaltres a la Rebeca és un exemple d'una veu important de la pau, realment. 
perquè, perquè han fet les coses a, a, a una manera d'organitzar-se que, que ha arribat lluny, ha arribat molt lluny, ens ha estat explicant un, un, un munt de dades fins on han arribat i, 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 que, i que han aconseguit aplegar un munt de gent. Llavors la pregunta és com, a, a, com se, es, va, es va cuinar la, la xarxa i ANSA i, i quin, quins, quins van ser els començaments i, i bueno, què va passar abans de l'any 99 o 98 que va, i ANSA va aparèixer en, en l'escenari públic i, i, per què, i per què és diferent de, de, les altres, de les altres iniciatives o organitzacions de la societat civil o NGOs o ONGs o com si vulguin dir en forma negativa, no sé, eh, perquè no ho ha no sé, és discutit, eh? però que, que el que em sembla que, que pot ser un, molt interessant és conèixer una mica la història personal de, de com es, com es s'involucra la Rebeca en, en, tota, en tota aquesta història. Um, thank you. So, um, on the question of how IANSA came about, it came about uh, kind of in, the, the, there were uh, civil society organizations working in, in development and also in the, general, in the wider peace movement and, um, and in the anti-nuclear movement who saw this problem of the increase in small arms at the end of the Cold War as suddenly becoming a huge problem. And so it was a bit in response to that. And also, um, as it also is, a, my answer is also, I would say, a, a child, or as Alphonse mentioned, or maybe a kind of stepchild or something related to the ICBL, the International Campaign to Ban Landmines, because that was an international campaign which showed that, that different groups working all around the world could work to, and people who had never met each other could combine in a very effective uh, and targeted action to bring about a treaty. In that case, the treaty is outside the United Nations, but um, that was a very, very successful campaign. And in fact, some people have said to us, it's so complicated, this issue with small arms, because you want, you want so many different things. Why can't you just have one, one thing, like the landmines campaign? Of course, that was much simpler because the campaign was to ban landmines. And in our case, it's not a campaign to ban small arms because, because every government in the world buys small arms. They buy them for their police, they buy them for their military, and they buy them for private ownership. It's, it's a, there's no country that is that is from the beginning not a consumer of a product. Whereas with landmines, many countries in the world did not buy landmines. It was easy for them to have a, a core of groups, you know, a, core, a group of core countries that were, could say, yeah, no problem, we're against landmines. Um, and also because landmines are not in private ownership, there is no national landmine association, for example, um, unlike the National Rifle Association. So there was aspects that it was, it, it was, it's simpler, that issue is simpler. On the other hand, we have an advantage in working on small arms that just, it, because every country imports or consumes, uses small arms, every country is affected. There's nowhere on, on earth where the where small arms and have not caused human suffering and enormous uh, and, and and tragedy for families and communities. In some countries, it's on a much larger scale. But if you know even one family where um, a person has has died suddenly, violently, and completely preventably because it was just it was a finger on a trigger that instant that could have been avoided. It's amazing the effect that it, even in one family, the damage that that can do to people all around. It's like when you drop a stone in the water and the, 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 the waves that come out. So it was related partly to that and also to this. At the same time, the United Nations was becoming interested in, so it was sort of synergy in um, 
uh, in the late 90s. In terms of myself, I was a journalist um, in Australia and very interested in, in questions of, of um, violence and peace and justice and especially women's rights. I'm a feminist. I, I um, have worked always on the issue of violence against women and uh, I was um, I was so interested in these topics that I decided to study law. So I went to law school and while I was at law school there was a, a massacre in, in Sydney in a, in a sh commercial shopping center of a man who had a, a, a semi-automatic rifle, he killed eight people, then he killed himself, and that kind of drew my attention to, he was a person who, there was no reason why he should have had a gun. He had said on his form when he went to buy it that he planned to use it for hunting, but everyone who knew him said, he's never been hunting. He was a taxi driver in the city, it was, you know, it was obviously a lie. And that was, and in those days, the law in Australia was that you could just claim everyone who wanted a gun for any reason wrote hunting. So apparently there was this huge millions of people claiming to be hunters. And, um, and I thought, this is crazy, the, the, the availability of these weapons. And that sort of, from then I began, I did a lot of work on it and um, wrote my thesis on it and, <laughs> and became an expert on it. And, and, and campaigned on it, and um, uh, and eventually that campaign was very successful, and we reformed all the laws in Australia, which is a federation. It was so we had to to move all the. It was good practice for IAN, so I had to move all the jurisdictions at the same time. Uh, and then I so and that was some um, uh, 15 years ago, 16 years ago. So I've I came into it because of my interest in in stopping violence and. Um, I never worked as a lawyer in the end. I've only worked as an activist since studying law. <laughs> so. Bueno, en español porque mi catalán tampoco es muy bueno. A ver, sí, las armas son completamente malas, tanto desde un cuchillo como una K47, pasando por todas las que hay en medio, bombas, etc. Eh, a mí lo que me gustaría saber es qué hace una persona eh, que, digamos, no tiene tiempo de ser tan activista como tú. A ver, yo tengo dos niños pequeños y evidentemente igual no me voy a ir a Kenia eh, en este momento de mi vida a formar parte de, de, de un movimiento así. Pero ¿qué se puede hacer o qué, qué consejo darías tú a alguien que, que quisiera ayudar un poco, sobre todo por eso, ¿no? pensando en que los niños evidentemente que ahora tengo crecerán y, ahora, y yo no quiero que sean ni portadores de un arma sí. ni eh, víctimas de un arma entonces claro, igual yo sé que no me voy a ir a yo que sé, 25 países a promover el, el, el alto a las armas pero, ¿qué podríamos hacer? ¿hay algún programa de, algo de voluntariado? ¿hay algún programa de algo que podamos hacer? Pues, supongo que en internet a la vez, pero bueno, quería oírlo de ti, de alguien que está dentro de ahí y que estaría bien que nos dijera un poco que a estas personas que no tenemos el, digamos, el tiempo, no es tiempo, sino simplemente el que tienes que ocupar tus energías en otro, en otro aspecto de momento, sí. ¿algún consejo, algún, algún, algún...? Sí, claro. Algo así? Este, ¿Vivís en Barcelona? Sí. Eh, bueno, eh, la... La primera cosa es de conectarte con la Fundación Pelapau, que, que son miembros de IANSA muy activos aquí, aquí en Cataluña eh, y que, bueno, les estoy haciendo propaganda, publicidad, estoy, habrá un folleto por allá. Y, este, que ellos tienen actividades eh, y no solo en la cuestión de las armas sino de la, la cultura de la paz en general y que, que es importante construir una cultura de paz eh, eh, para, que, para, para, para abordar la problemática del, del punto de vista de esta cuestión de eh, eh, que, que la violencia no es una solución para una situación tensa sea entre países o entre personas. Eh, además, eh, 
hay muchísimas cosas que uno puede hacer sentada ahí en la cocina mientras el niño está tomando la siestecita. <ríe> Por ejemplo, escribiendo cartas al, al, al redactor, se dice, al editor, al periódico. Eh, que yo sé porque antes era periodista, que hay como una, un formula, formulario muchas veces que usan que, bueno, si reciben cinco o seis cartas en el mismo tema, les parece que, bueno, esto será un tema de mucho interés popular. Aunque sea un, un periódico con tres millones de lectores, reciben cinco o seis cartas y les parece representativo, ¿no? Entonces, <risa> Entonces y me imagino que es algo que la, los, la gente asociada con la Fundación Pelapao, me imagino que, que ellos tendrán como un programa para ayudar a, con eso. Desde el punto de vista de la red mundial, hay muchísimas cosas que siempre necesitamos, ayuda con traducciones, ayuda con cuestiones de de cosas así, como prácticas, mm. también muchas veces escribiendo mm. una cosa o buscando en un momento de, por ejemplo, en, a veces en momentos como críticos, cuando ocurre una, una matanza o una, una, un acto un, de desgracia en alguna parte del mundo y cuando ese es el momento que tenemos que agarrar para, para hacer el trabajo con los medios, en ese momento muchas veces necesitamos gente que haga, que se ponga a, como a buscar información, números de contactos o lo que sea, uh -huh. y nuestro, muchos de nuestros miembros son, eh, son cosas así que están haciendo que no requieren una, un conocimiento um, súper de la política ni, ni de las armas, ni de la balística ni de la política. Uh -huh. Pero primer punto de contacto sería con la Fundación. Fantástico, gracias. Ya me pregunto, ¿ves? Sí. Uh... Farem l'última, hi ha algú més que... Bé, doncs fem per al primer. Sí, que la haré en castellano, perquè així puc les contestar ràpid. Sí, jo la haré ràpid, també. Jo querria saber si la campanya Control Arms té una estratègia específica per contrarrestar el poder de l'Associació Nacional del Rifle ante la població norteamericana, és a dir, ante la població d'Estats Units. Entre totes les estratègies que hi ha, si hi ha alguna que vaya directamente focalizada a la población de Estados Unidos? La respuesta corta es no, eh, porque el problema con los Estados Unidos hay muchos, no, el problema con los Estados Unidos hay muchos, mm -hmm. pero eh, es que la cantidad de recursos que se necesita para, eh, no solo para eh, contra para responder a la, para contra, ¿cómo se dice? Contra la, 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 la Asociación Nacional de Rifle, pero nada más para inserirte, para hacerte oír en, la, en el, el ambiente mediático en los Estados Unidos, es impresionante lo que cuesta. Pero también porque, porque un problema en los Estados Unidos, en los Estados Unidos no es tanto que las, la gente, eh, los ciudadanos de los Estados Unidos, no son fanáticos pro armas. Nosotros sabemos porque nuestros miembros en los Estados Unidos han hecho en, encuestas y, y como para saber cuál es la opinión pública. Y sabemos que en general el ciudadano o la ciudadana norteamericana tiene como más o menos el mismo punto de vista de que el resto del mundo, que las armas deberían ser controladas, que debería haber, por ejemplo, un límite del número de armas que la gente puede tener, que deberían estar registradas, que debería haber un, un, un sistema de licencia. Eh, y además que los, los, la gente que tiene armas, que más o el, como el, el 35% de hogares en los Estados Unidos contienen un arma. La mayoría son eh, armas de caza, pero eh, los que esas personas tampoco son fanáticos, usan sus armas para cazar y también más o menos las opiniones son un poco menos pro control que la mayoría, pero no tanto. Y hasta los miembros de, las, de la asociación de rifle en general no son fanáticos. Es, hay como un desconjunto, descompuesto, entre, <ríe> entre la posición del liderazgo de la asociación, las posiciones que toma eh, y, bueno, 
se ve que hay al, al menos 110 mil personas en la asociación que son fanáticos porque ellos fueron los que firmaron las cartas. Fue una carta a modelo que, que les mandó la asociación para mandar a Kofi Annan, ¿no? Eh, pero la mayoría no, no es que son tan dedicadas al tema de las armas, pero es que el sistema político en los Estados Unidos es que los, las decisiones que se hacen en el Congreso dependen mucho de eh, cuestiones de dinero, las donaciones eh, políticas y la, el, la asociación de rifle gasta mucho dinero en las elecciones y es, es un poco el sistema que tienen que es muy particular donde los, los miembros del Congreso no, no reflejan lo, lo que quiere la gente. ¿no? Entonces no es tanto problema con el, las, los ciudadanos sino con el gobierno de los Estados Unidos que tenemos. Estamos esperando tal vez si vemos un cambio de, de, de regime, eh, sí. <risa> un cambio de gobierno en los Estados Unidos, pero tampoco bajo Clinton, tampoco era mucho mejor, eh, porque los congresistas eran más o menos, tenían siempre la misma, la misma situación, necesitan millones de dólares para ganar su, su, su puesto en la legislatura y... Pero lo que sí podrían tomar es posiciones como menos extremas, ¿no? Podrían al menos abstenerse en vez de bloquear cosas que van a afectar el resto del mundo. Y eso es lo que esperamos tal vez con un cambio de gobierno. Eh, pero entonces no, básicamente. Y también hay como una resistencia en nuestra red de... Eh, enfocar demasiada atención en los Estados Unidos, ¿no? Porque los Estados Unidos domina todos los discursos sobre el medio ambiente, sobre cualquier cosa, siempre los Estados Unidos. Entonces, hay un poco, un poco cuestión de, eh, de reconocer que... Ah, te, te digo una cosa, yo hice un debate contra el presidente, del, de, no el presidente, el director de eh, la Asociación de Rifle. Eh, y en eso... Eh, me puso una pregunta, eh, si Rebeca piensa que los ciudadanos norteamericanos deberían tener que obedecer a las Naciones Unidas. Pero bueno, eso no es el sistema, no es que una persona tiene que obedecer a, a las Naciones Unidas. Pero yo dije, los ciudadanos americanos, como, como cualquier otro ciudadano en el mundo, eh, deberían vivir por, eh, bajo las mismas reglas que el resto del mundo. No debería ser un sistema para el mundo y otro para los norteamericanos. Y esta, fra, esta oración, esta, este soundbite que dije yo, ha, se ha convertido como en una, el slogan de campaña de la asociación diciendo, miren, Rebeca piensa que los, los ciudadanos norteamericanos son como cualquier otro ciudadano en el mundo. Es como el, la, la, la peor cosa que pude haber dicho. Entonces, y, y fue como muy interesante desde el punto de vista psicológico de, de cómo es que eso, que, 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 que eso es la cosa más eh, como es controvertida, más provocativa que, que, que puede decir, pero eso es la cosa que ellos están usando en su campaña para eh, de fundraising, es eh, eso es lo que dice Rebeca. Bien, tenemos la última pregunta. Yo te quería hacer dos preguntas. La primera es, o sea, ¿cuál crees que es la, la razón principal por la cual los, o sea, los, los pro-armas um, no, o sea, quieren seguir con las armas? Yo personalmente pienso que es puramente o básicamente razones económicas. ¿Qué piensas tú? Y si no es esto, pues, ¿qué otra suerte? Y la segunda es, viene un poco por lo que acabas de decir, la, cuando te, te confrontas con, por ejemplo, de National Rifle Club Association, um, ¿qué, o sea, ¿qué límite hay entre uh, cuán diplomática tienes que ser y cuán, cuán, cuánto puedes atacarles? O sea, porque yo pienso, por ejemplo, que les podrías decir algo como, o sea, si, si, si mi opinión ganara, uh, vuestra asociación desaparecería, ¿no? Y, um, 
Entonces, o sea, ¿hasta qué punto tienes que ser diplomática? ¿Hasta qué, o sea, ¿Dónde está el límite? ¿Y cómo, y cómo, o sea, cómo trabajas contra eso? Sí, okay. este, en la cuestión de los pro-armas, ¿estás diciendo desde el punto de vista de los individuos o de los, país, de los gobiernos pro-armas? ¿O de cuál es la, en la motivación de la... De ¿A qué nivel me estás preguntando? Sí, a nivel, bueno, a nivel de gobierno. De, de los gobiernos. Eh, una, eh, en algunos casos es un interés económico, por ejemplo, China y eh, Pakistán son vendedores de armas muy grandes a los mercados, eh, sea ilícitos o irresponsables. Eh, hay muchas armas en Sudán que son hechas en China. Eh, entonces, eh, en, en algunos lugares es eso. En otros lugares es una percepción que hay un interés económico, aunque la verdad eh, es otra. Eh, por ejemplo, en Rusia ellos piensan que eh, tienen un interés económico en la venta de, de armas ligeras, pero si lo... Si, si uno mira las estadísticas y mira el precio que está pagando que están pagando Rusia mismo dentro que es un país con muchísima violencia por, por armas de fuego y también el como el, el, el caos que están causando pero tienen como una idea antigua de bueno hay como hay, hay algunos pueblos en Rusia donde el único la única fuente de trabajo es la fábrica de las AK-47. Son pocas, pero eso es... En otros, eh, por ejemplo, eh, lo que me han dicho es que los gobiernos del Medio Oriente, el bloque árabe, que es que muchas veces, por ejemplo, Egipto, que se opone, es una cuestión de eh, que ellos no quieren eh, participar a una, lo que ven que es una, un proyecto del occidente. Eh, que esta gente de Europa no nos van a decir a nosotros qué es lo que tenemos que hacer. Es como una, una resistencia basada más en una cosa como ideológica y no en, en un interés económico. Entonces hay diferentes. Pero en general, un problema muy grande es que el, hay una mentalidad antigua de que es bueno tener que todos los países tienen que tener muchas armas porque es, la, es, esa, es esa la seguridad nacional. Entonces lo que estamos tratando de decir nosotros es que lo más importante es la seguridad humana que la, y, y que la idea de la seguridad nacional muchas veces, aunque te estás, estás tratando, porque por ejemplo estos gobiernos que tienen una acumulación muy grande de armas para protegerse, por ejemplo en Latinoamérica, están, no es que... ¿Con quién van a hacer guerra? ¿no? Eh, en, en, ¿Con quién va a hacer guerra Brasil? ¿Contra quién? ¿Con quién va a hacer guerra México? No, es que no, no es una cosa de seguridad nacional eh, con el enemigo exter en el exterior, sino tratando de, de decirles, miren adentro que la seguridad, que les, la inseguridad que están generando dentro de sus países es lo que deberían estar tratando de solucionar. En la cuestión de... Yo, en general, a, a nosotros no nos sirve estar en eh, confrontamientos con el lobby pro armas. Eh, yo hice la, este debate porque eh, nos pidió un canal de televisión eh, y me pareció que podría ser útil que hacer, tener como un video que, para nuestros miembros para ver cuáles son los argumentos entre los dos lados. Y fue muy interesante porque se ve en el video los dos los, los estilos distintos que tenemos también los, el público distinto que tenemos en el tipo de, de la asociación de rifle estaba como muy atacándome a mí personalmente diciendo eh, eh, cosas bueno, co, cosas eh, mucho más civilizadas de las que me dicen otras personas por armas pero pero él decía eh, la señora Peters quiere eh, abolir la constitución de los Estados Unidos, la señora Peters quiere, eh, que, quiere quitarnos la libertad, ella está a favor de las dictaduras, ella quiere que, eh, una cosa como dis, eh, anunciando con, continuamente lo que, 
lo que se ven es, quiero yo, qué es lo que pienso, qué es lo que... Diciendo también, la señora Pérez ha dicho es tal y tal cosa, cosas que yo no he dicho. Pero, y en ese momento, eh, yo tuve que decidir si me voy a dedicar a decir, bueno, no, yo no dije eso, pero que parece como muy defensivo, <risa> o si no, de ir adelante con el programa mío. El programa mío es hablar del problema, hablar de las soluciones políticas, jurídicas, eh, eh, que tenemos que encontrar porque el público suyo son, eh, es su base de donaciones el público mío son, es un público mucho más grande que son la comunidad de, de grupos que tienen un interés en, en, en la, la vida humana la seguridad humana y que yo quiero que ellos se interesen en el tema y, y, y que, bueno, que, que trabajen en eso y también los gobiernos, que son en general la gente de gobierno, es gente seria. Entonces, para mí yo pierdo votos si me pongo a, a atacarlo a él. Y es interesante, eh, lo que el, eh, el productor del, del programa me dijo, nos dijo, me, me dijo a mí, bueno, yo diría que vos ganaste el debate, pero la verdad es que los dos han ganado y es verdad, el, el, la asociación del RIF está vendiendo el video del debate, lo puedes comprar por 5 dólares en su sitio web, donde dicen, eh, miren donde hemos como eh, capturado en sus propias palabras la, <risa> la, como la... la lo, el, el plan maquiavélico, de, como el plan secreto de Rebeca y las Naciones Unidas. Piensa, muchas veces dicen que yo soy la, eh, estoy liderando, liderando la campaña de las Naciones Unidas para prohibir las armas. Es como, están confundidos entre Yanza, las Naciones Unidas, bueno, más o menos igual. <risa> yo, Kofi, bueno, nos parecemos. <risa> eh, y el... Eh, y entonces eso les, les sirve muy bien y para nosotros, a nuestros miembros nos sirvió muy bien también porque ahí está mucha información y que pueden ver qué tipo de, cuáles son como la, la, la lógica de, 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 de la asociación. Pero en general, eh, muchas, los periodistas muchas veces quieren, dicen, bueno, hagamos una pelea porque es como entretiene la gente, ¿no? Es un tipo de espectáculo, pero para, para avanzar la política en general no nos sirve. Entonces, en general yo trato de siempre ser como cortés, y, pero otra, otra cosa que, no, es que, pero sí, otra cosa es que ellos usan mucho los, los segmentos de ese debate, lo usan en sus como sus speeches, como esta la que he hecho yo hoy, el, el tipo hace mu muchas presentaciones en conferencias de causas muy de conservadoras, por ejemplo en los Estados Unidos, y le encanta tener como un pedazo de este debate demostrando esta mujer, cabello corto, eh, de, de otro país, eh, eh, que... Y la, y la amenaza y en, su, y en la pusieron en la revista tienen una revista mensual y pusieron en la en la portada, en la portada sí eh, y dentro de la, el, 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 la nota escrito por el tipo dijo eh, eh, nosotros les hemos dicho en nuestra revista las cosas que dice Rebe, Rebeca pero pues tienes que mirar el video para ver su, su cómo se dice body language eh, para, eh, sí, para, para, se ve en la mirada <risa> mirando en, se ve en los ojos cuál es el plan sinistro que tiene para... <risa> entonces es muy como eh, hay mucha emoción es que pero estamos para ellos es una cosa de para eh, tener para cómo se dice fundraising captar fondos y para nosotros estamos tratando de influir un proceso en las Naciones Unidas, un, un, un proyecto distinto. Un, una respuesta muy larga. Bien, <risa> muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias.